Hi! Whether you're a button mash hack and slash controller bash, or a meeple moving mastermind of maps, mats, and minis, if you ruffle at the awful ruffle shuffle scuffle, or if you're a click clack pick attack number ball luck sack, we're all here for the same reason. I'm Jake. Let's talk games. <laughs> I'm going to start with a bold assertion. Magic the Gathering is not a game. It's actually a bunch of games. See, Wizards of the Coast manages a number of different formats that all have different restrictions. You have Standard, where it's only cards that came out in the last couple of years. Modern, which is basically everything that came out after 2002, give or take. You have Legacy and Vintage, which go all the way back, but one has a very large ban list and the other has a very large restricted list, meaning you can only play one of certain cards. Then you have EDH, which also has a very long ban list, but also you can only play one of each card in your deck. You have Popper, where you can't play anything that isn't printed as a common at some point in the past, even if they're more than a common now. You have Draft, where you open up booster packs, pass cards, and everyone plays with the same sealed pool. You have Sealed, where you don't get to pass cards and you all have to play with the same sealed pool. You have Historic, which goes back basically as far as Magic Arena goes, because... They needed a new format because they didn't want to add other cards to Arena. Anyways, there's a lot of different formats, and they're all difficult to follow, and they don't match up well against each other. That's a problem. If you have a new player that comes into a store, decides they want to play Magic, and picks up a Planeswalker deck, sits down at the table, and their opponent only has a Legacy Elves deck, it's not gonna go well. And chances are that person's going to be put off of Magic for a long time. They're going to say, well, this deck I got for $10, but your deck cost, well, about $1,200. I don't think I can afford this game. Kitchen Table Magic is how I got into playing the game. Maybe yours was a little bit different. It might not have been a kitchen table. Maybe yours was Lunch Table Magic, or Stairwell Next to Homeroom Magic, or maybe it was... Lunch breaks at the office because we didn't want to talk about work. Magic. As the case may be, we all started playing this game at one point or another, and if you haven't started playing this game yet, I highly encourage you to check it out. It is one of my favorite games of all time, I can't seem to stop playing it, and I have kind of hit an equilibrium with the amount of money that I spend on this game versus the amount of money that I get out of this game. To talk about this today, I would like to go over one of my last Kitchen Table Magic decks. I say last because I don't really have a good place to play Kitchen Table Magic right now. It seems everything has moved into EDH. So I have a number of EDH stuff, but no good 60 card random good stuff decks. And that's where Kitchen Table Magic really excels. It allows you to build things that are absolutely ridiculous, over the top, contain banned cards, restricted cards, cards that otherwise you wouldn't be able to play together, and do ridiculous things like decking out an infinite number of players, or making an infinite, infinite, unblockable griffin land, and beating your opponent to death. There are so many different options in Kitchen Table Magic that you can't realistically play in other formats, and it makes me sad to see that fall off. So I want to go through this deck. I want to talk about what's in it. It is a mono blue high tide deck. It is disgustingly powerful, and it's one of my favorite decks of all times. So come on over, have a look. This one is amazing. So, high tide. Let's talk about how this deck works. Before we get into it, first I want to talk about a couple of terms that I'm going to use that everyone is probably going to need to understand and be on the same page. First, the way Magic the Gathering works is you play land, and each land taps for one mana. You're only allowed to play one land each turn, so turn one, you can produce one mana. You can use that to cast spells that cost up to one mana. Some spells are free, but not many, and they're usually not super powerful. Turn two, you can cast a two mana cost spell, or two one mana cost spells. That's really handy because it allows you to balance powerful spells 
versus several lower power spells. If you follow that trend, turn 3, you have 3 mana, turn 4, you have 4 mana, and so on, you can't play very powerful cards until turn 6 or 7. If you follow that curve, this is known as fair magic. If you don't play something, mana costs 6, before turn 6 you are playing fair. Our goal is to turn that on its head and play as unfairly as possible. We are trying to accelerate much faster than the one land per turn limit allows us to. So let's begin. Why is this deck called High Tide? Well, you'll notice we start with a bunch of islands. But that's not why it's called High Tide. The reason is this card here. It's namesake High Tide, which allows islands to produce two mana. This means on turn three, we get to play like it's turn six. And if our opponent went first, they'll be on turn three while we're playing like turn six, and that's not that fair. But if we went first, they're only on turn two. They have two mana to play with, well, we can potentially make six. Realistically, our first mana goes into high tide, so we're a little bit handicapped in that that land's already tapped. But we have ways of fixing that. So the next few cards all allow us to draw cards. Brainstorm is draw three. Impulse is look at the top four and choose one. Meditate is draw four and skip your next turn. But the way this deck plays out, we're not going to be getting another turn. This is it. Finally, we come to Frantic Search. This is the engine that keeps our deck moving. Draw two cards, then you discard two cards, which doesn't matter so much, and you untap three lands. Well, now our lands that are already supercharged are untapped and can be used to produce more mana. Generally, by turn three or four, we have enough mana to power out many spells in a single turn, and Frantic Search allows us to double that. We come to Merchant Scroll next, which can search for almost any card in our deck. Mystical Tutor also can almost find anything in our deck, and is a really useful tutor to have because it can find, well, our win condition. Next up we have Time Spiral. This card wins us the game. Technically it doesn't win us the game, but we draw seven cards and untap six lands, all things even, we are so far ahead at this point that we are almost certainly winning the game. Following that, we have Sensei's Divining Top. This evens out our draws, allows us to rearrange the top three cards of our deck, and has a second ability that is generally nowhere near as useful as the first. You draw a card and put Sensei's Divining Top on top of your deck. Which is good, but not great. We're drawing a lot of cards, so this breaks even, right? We play a card and then draw a card and this goes back, so our net card advantage is zero, and it costs us a mana. But if we have Helm of Awakening, it doesn't cost us a mana, the card is free. So one Helm of Awakening and two Sensei's Divining Tops allow us to cast infinite spells. We can follow that with a Brain Freeze, which is our win condition. And this allows us to take three cards off the top of any player's deck for each spell played this turn. Since we've played all the spells, we can take all of the cards from any number of players. We can target all of the opponents at the table. If you're sitting at a table of six, we deck them all out instantly. This isn't fair. This is not fair magic. This is turn four we accelerate to the point where we instantly win the game against an arbitrary number of opponents. That's scary. What's not as scary is that we have no answers. If our opponent's faster than us, we lose. If they counter one of our main spells, we lose. If they get a board online of a lot of big creatures that can beat us, we lose. We have very few answers, very few ways to respond to things, we just go very fast, we combo out, and we slam the table with a brain freeze. If that doesn't win us the game, that's all we got. If they have a laboratory maniac, we, we just enabled their win condition. They instantly win the game. So the deck isn't unbeatable. In fact, it's very beatable. 
but it's fast enough that it is still super fun to play, and it's actually pretty fun to play against. You're playing a dicey game, riding a razor's edge on this one, and over the course of a game, your opponent will likely learn very quickly the do's and do nots of play against this deck. If you give it too much time, it's going to guarantee a win. If you can't beat it quickly, you need a way to slow it down or stop it. I think a deck like this helps a metagame stay fresh. If you get too used to blowing up creatures and bringing things back from the graveyard and games take forever, throw in something fast. Throw in something brutal that demands an answer immediately. This is my favorite example of a kitchen table magic deck. It's very fast and very powerful and doesn't have very many answers, but it demands your opponents have a way of dealing with it. So it's not fair by any means, but it's a fun deck to play, and it's healthy for the environment to have a couple of these. This might not work in your local game store. This might not work in your circles of kitchen table magic. Some of the cards in here I know have become very expensive, but you'll notice the deck is unsleeved. It is obviously riffle shuffled. This deck has been played to death, hundreds of hours on it. I absolutely adore it, and most of the people that I've played against enjoy having this in the environment and having this as part of their local kitchen table magic scene. Anyways, I hope that was a good brief look at what our kitchen table environment looked like. And I know yours might be different, and that's okay. But please, sit down with your friends, make some ridiculous decks, tell some stories, create some fun times in maybe a less structured environment than you're used to. I'm Jake. I've really liked talking with you. I have a lot of links down below. Check them out. I'll see you next time. Just because I know a lot of people out there aren't going to believe me.